Welcome to this reflection on the Plenary Council in Australia. So the, the first thing to understand about the Plenary Council is it didn't happen by accident. It was the fruit of a long process of preparation that in this instance ran explicitly for more than four years. So after the, the Australian Catholic Bishops Conference decided that, it, that move in the direction of having a Plenary Council, the, the question obviously is, well, what is a Plenary Council? How do you set it up? How does it work? And so on. And resolving all of those issues and preparing for the event that was held in July of 2022, as I said, ran for four years. And during that four years, the, the, the theme of the council remained the same, namely, how does the church in Australia listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us? That, that was the, the framing question and the framing purpose of the whole of the Plenary Council. And a Plenary Council, I'm not a canonist, so I can't get into all the canonical niceties of a Plenary Council, but what it comes down to basically is the Plenary Council is a law-making body for a local church, in this instance, for the, the whole church in Australia. A and the, the background over the four years was first to listen to people. So there were lots of public consultation. People were invited to join groups of reflecting on what they thought the issues were, what the questions were, what the needs of the church in Australia went. And as many as 220,000 people participated in those listening sessions. That's an extraordinary number of people. And it included people who deeply committed to the life of the church. It included people who are alienated from the life of the church. It included people who you know, might have a passing interest and not even be Catholic. So it was a wide sweeping and deep process of reflection. And those listening sessions together with written submissions, which numbered again in the thousands that people were invited to contribute, led ultimately to the, the distillation of a number of themes during 2019, 2020. And in October of 2021, there was the, the first assembly of the Plenary Council. And it's called the, the Fifth Plenary Council of Australia. The other four, the most recent one, was in fact in 1935. So it was a good time between drinks for the plenary councils in Australia. And the 1935 one was composed primarily of bishops. The 2021-22, the two assemblies, was more reflective of the whole nature of the church in Australia. Bishops certainly, priests but the majority of members of the council were lay people, men and women, a range of ages, younger people, older people, a diversity of backgrounds, and so on. In October 21, the plan initially was to have the first assembly of the council in Adelaide. And Adelaide was chosen as roughly geographically centre to Australia, but also has deep connections with Mary MacKillop, Saint Mary of the Cross MacKillop, who was Australia's first saint. Unfortunately, COVID intervened in all of that. So rather than having the First Assembly gather in Adelaide, the whole thing was done over Microsoft Teams. This is a free plug for Microsoft Teams. In fact, the, the, the exercise was so extensive when you're having more than 300 people trying to meet across different time zones, uh, this is a major logistical undertaking, so much so that Microsoft, the company, was itself monitoring it because they didn't know how Teams would go when being used ex that extensively. I'd have to say, though, that it, the whole week, by and large, went without significant hitches. So there was a great spirit, even though people weren't face-to-face, and what came out of that week, that wasn't a week of voting, it was a week of refining the themes, reflecting on them, with the goal that they would then be presented at the July gathering in Sydney, where there would be votes taken, there would be um, you know, position papers that the members would vote on. 
And so between last October and about April or May of 2022 this year, the the reflections from that first assembly were refined into eight areas that the the members would vote on in July. There were a number of position papers that were distributed in advance, videos, all sorts of ways to aid reflection and the coming together of the assembly in Sydney. The first thing to point out about the assembly in Sydney is it happened in absolutely grotesque weather. For the first four days from the Sunday when we began till the, the Wednesday, we had apocalyptic wind and rainstorm. So you couldn't move anywhere in the city without getting totally drenched. And that meant for members who were spread around the inner city, uh, no one was more than uh, about half a mile walk from the uh, from this the conference venue, which was St. Mary's Cathedral. But to move around the city was it, itself an act of faith, given the weather. The assembly began on the Sunday evening where the first liturgy was celebrated in North Sydney, so about uh, a few kilometres, a few miles from where the, uh, the, the assembly itself was being held, because that's the birthplace, uh, the, sorry, the burial the, of Mary MacKillop. So we gathered around that tomb of Australia's first saint. And that was a, a powerful symbol of that this was a genuinely Australian gathering. The areas that the assembly gathered on were, as I'd mentioned, the distillation of all the things that had been talked about and suggested over the four years previously. And the centerpiece, the, the first priority of the council, was to talk about reconciliation with Australia's Indigenous people. That, that has become in Australia, in society at general, a, a far more focused issue. So there are discussions going on in Australia at the moment about how might that we include Aboriginal people who are not specifically mentioned in the Australian Constitution, how might they have a voice, this is the term being used, how might they have a voice to the Australian Parliament? So the spirit of reconciliation, the recognition of the harm that's been done to Indigenous people uh, since uh, European settlement of Australia at the end of the 18th century is a front and centre national issue and so it's a front and centre issue for the Catholic Church in Australia as well. So one feature of uh, the, the Assembly Week was the use of welcome, what's called welcome to country which is to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you're gathered. And by country, it's not simply the, the whole of Australia, but the particular country of the Aboriginal group who uh, are connected to that part of, of, of the, 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 the state on which you're gathering. So each day there was an acknowledgement of country. There was Aboriginal people doing the welcome to country. Uh, there was what's called a smoking ceremony, and smoking ceremony uh, is a, a rite of purification uh, that's central to Aboriginal spirituality. So all of that was part of this gathering of the country, of the Catholic Church in Australia. And the first set of motions that were agreed to was both the need to affirm the importance of reconciliation with Aboriginal people, the need to acknowledge the church's failures, but also a search for how do we include Aboriginal symbols, not just at the beginning of our liturgies, but as an integral part of the liturgy. So that's part of the ongoing challenge facing the church in Australia. And I think that's an enormously positive Development. So the contribution of the Aboriginal members, the Indigenous members of the Plenary Council, was very strongly affirmed and welcomed. I think the most encouraging thing about the whole assembly was to stand in the main assembly room and to see this representation of the church in Australia gathered around these tables. So there was no hierarchical seating bishops took part as members alongside everybody else. Now, when it came to voting, there's a, there's a two-tiered segment of voting. 
all the members had what was called a consultative vote, a way of getting a sense of whether the assembly as a whole would support ideas and motions. The bishops, because this was a law-making body, the bishops had what was called a deliberative vote. And that was that they had the final vote on motions. Now, you might say, well, that means bishops could decide everything for themselves and that the rest of it was really uh, not terribly important. But I think that was profoundly not so. The, the interchange between the members in general and the bishop member, the Episcopal members in particular, I, I think was very influential on the bishops' participation. This really was the synodal voice that Pope Francis talks about. One point that became a matter of controversy that in fact made international press, not just in Australia, but it picked up around the world, was that on the Wednesday, there was a, a, a segment on, of the council's agenda on the equal participation of women in the life of the church. And the motions on that part included motions about being open to the ordination of women as deacons. When that introduction to that section and the motions went to the consultative vote, not all of it passed, and I should say that to pass, every motion required a two-thirds vote, both two-thirds of the consultative voters and two-thirds of the deliberative voters. So one section was voted down by the consultative voters, and when the Episcopal vote was taken, in fact, all of the motions were voted down and even the introduction was voted down. Now, as you can imagine, that caused a crisis in the midst of the assembly. When we resumed after that uh, voting, a good number of members stood at the, vote of the, at the back of the hall rather than take their place at the tables to indicate that this was a critical moment, that we couldn't just move forward with it. And so the the, the deputy president who was at chairing the the the, uh, the assembly at that stage recognised the urgency of this moment and indeed that we couldn't just move forward. So during a break over lunch, the bishops met and there were a number of other people, a good number of other people engaged in their own reflection of that over lunch. And after lunch, it was decided that what needed to happen was that the material that had been rejected needed to be reconsidered and resubmitted, that it would be sent to a committee of four, one bishop and three, uh, two members and one con of the uh, theological consultants to rework that material with the goal of resubmitting it, which happened on the Friday. And when the material came back on the Friday, both the preamble, the introduction to the motions, and the motions of themselves were accepted both by the consultative voters and then by the Episcopal vote. It didn't mean that everyone agreed with them or that everyone accepted them, and there still was significant opposition, but nonetheless, both the, the preamble and the motions achieved the two-thirds needed to pass. What's more important, I think, even than the outcome of that those votes was the process. First, that we could recognise that you can't just ignore that this issue about the participation of women in the church is a major topic for the life of the church and also for the perception of the, the Catholic Church by people outside. So it was important that we heard the voices of those who felt deeply hurt by its rejection. It was important that we were able to rework the material and then it was important that the material ultimately was accepted. So that was the most critical moment of the church, of the assembly. That was the moment that certainly got all the, uh, the publicity and attention. But the, it was also a sign that the process works, that synodality can produce significant outcomes for the life of the church. There were other motions on the environment, on formation for ministers, on coordinating the various aspects of the life of the church that were, were accepted so it was an enormously wide agenda, 
And yet it's a very positive agenda for setting the future of the church in Australia. And it has as part of it, and this is, is really important, ways of checking this. So timetables for implementation, processes for reviews, and so on. So rather than saying, well, we got to the Friday no or the Saturday morning and it all finished and everyone home and we'll probably forget about the plenary council. No, there are ways of ensuring that this is taken up into the life of the church, that there, there are uh, litmus tests for timetables about how things have to be measured. And even some of those timetables were advanced. So the, the proposals on the, the, the church in all areas of Australian life, accepting the Laudato Si framework was something that was supposed to happen in 2030 and now it was moved to 2024 so that there's a, a greater sense of immediacy and urgency about implementing these motions in the life of the church. As an overall assessment, I'd have to say I am very strongly positive that this was a, a a really significant moment for the life of the church. It, it, it wasn't perfect, it didn't meet everyone's expectations, but the more I stood in that room with all of the members, the more it was so evident to me that people were there because they wanted the good of the church, that they that had to learn, I think all of us had to learn, that this was not merely a political process. It wasn't about winners and losers, but it really was about the discernment, about the listening to the spirit that Pope Francis had been advocating. One thing I've been thinking about since is Cardinal Newman in his, um, uh, on consulting the faithful in matters of doctrine, says that the, the, the lay people in the church open to the gift of the Holy Spirit, have what Newman calls a jealousy of error. And what he means by that, I think, is that people want to get it right. If they're participating in the life of the church, they want it to be healthy. They want it to be positive. They want to contribute. And that was such a strong feeling at the council that those who were its members really were committed to seeing a healthy, vibrant, reconciling church that could face its own failures, as in areas of abuse, as in the, the, the marginalised participation of women, as in certain structures, and could want those changed, but could want them changed not simply to make a political point, but to further the mission of the church in Australia. The task now, of course, is implementation. And it's also the task of spreading out amongst the members of the church in Australia at large and not simply the members of the plenary council, what the council did, what the spirit of the council uh, was and what the ongoing task of the church in Australia is. So I've, I've, I've mentioned that one of the features of the, the the uh, the assembly gathering of the council was seeing bishops sitting next to other members of the church in that spirit of of not merely friendship but something far more far deeper than that in the sense of a shared commitment to and a shared responsibility for the life of the church. One of the uh, themes that the council voted on was was to talk about governance because governance always is a contentious matter in the life of the church. And in the Australian context, a couple of years ago, so during the pandemic, uh, there was a, a major report released called Light from the Southern Cross, which is a, a, a significant document on governance and co-responsibility in the life of the church. And that report, which was commissioned by the Bishops' Conference, was itself a direct response to something that the Royal Commission on Sexual Abuse in Institutions had basically ordered the Australian bishops to do, to look at its own organs of governance and possibilities of greater co-responsibility. So Light from the Southern Cross is a direct response to that need. And... 
Life from the South and Cross makes an enormous number of recommendations for how governance and practices of governance might become more co-responsible in the Australian church. And so the Plenary Council, without debating all of the recommendations of Light from the Southern Cross, nonetheless accepted the need for those recommendations to be looked at uh, with an eye to what can be implemented in the life of the church. So I think it's not merely we've got to change all the church's organs of governance, but it's rather we, what we have to be aware of, and this links with the collegial spirit, it links with the synodal spirit, it, it is that governance has long since ceased to be possible in the church as merely a top-down mechanism. Uh, that if we take seriously that we are a community who by baptism share the one spirit, then we must also share a responsibility for how the church organises and practise governance. And I think the that was unequivocally clear at the Plenary Council. And again, it's one of the things that we look now to how is this going to be implemented? What difference is this going to make? So if we have been doing what the plenary's motto says, namely listening to what the Spirit is saying to the church in Australia. The, the task now is to implement what we have heard and to see how we might further the mission of the church in this time and in this place. So the, the plenary council is an expression of the church's synodality. So we all know that not only has Pope Francis talked often about synodality, but he's introduced the, the Synod on Synodality, which will be uh, in place in, over the next couple of years and for which lots of consultations all around the world have been taking place. It, it seems to me the Plenary Council helps us to understand how this works, that synodality is not just a theory, but that you can see it in action. And it's not an entirely smooth process, as I described with that one major uh, moment of upheaval in the life of the Plenary Council. It wasn't all smooth. Not everyone had the same opinion. But I think what we can see from the Plenary Council is that synodality is not a disruptive thing that simply causes problems and we should all avoid. That synodality is a creative process of the church discerning what the Spirit might be saying. And that means addressing contentious issues. It means addressing divisive issues. But if that is done in a spirit of openness to the Spirit, in a spirit of goodwill, of giving other people credit for wanting good, even if they their opinions and my opinions are different, then you can come to a constructive, uh, positive outcome that will benefit all the members of the church and certainly benefit the church's mission.